Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Career Development and Mental Health. Our webinar today is provided by the NCDA constituency for private practice, business, industry, and agencies. Our amazing presenters are Dr. Michael Hall and Dr. Sharon Givens. Feel free to type questions and comments in the chat. The, the chat is set to private for privacy reasons, which means that only the moderator, me, will see your questions and comments. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and say hello, I will see it, and I'll share your questions and comments with the presenters later on during the webinar. Career development and mental health. Let's begin with Dr. Givens. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend the webinar. Um, again, I'm Sharon Givens and I'm the trustee uh, on the NCDA Board of Directors, uh, trustee for private practice, business and industry and agency. So tonight we're gonna talk just a little bit about career development and mental health. And what I plan to offer in this presentation is some effective strategies for practitioners. So why is career development and mental health important? The actually bridging the two concepts together. So career choice and development tr traditionally have been viewed as distinct and separate from mental health services. But given the relationship between the two, it's vital that pra as practitioners, we're able to address both or we understand the odd the art of referral in terms of making sure that our clients get the appropriate service when we feel like we're not equipped. Mental health and career counseling have generally been viewed as separate entities in both training and practice. However, they certainly are strongly related. Individuals seeking career counseling often present a complex array of issues. Uh, many times clients present with their, actually saying their presenting problem is career development, but there's so many other underlining issues that have to be addressed. And it's difficult for counselors to actually separate career satisfaction and development from mental health issues. I believe that if we do career work that we have to look at the whole person. So work in mental health. Let's take a quick look at some factors that influence, some work factors that actually influence mental health. Well, you have unemployment. Many of the clients that I've seen that have unemployment also are depressed, of course. Stressed, anxiety. So that's certainly some contributors in terms of mental health or some influences when they are unemployed. Underemployment, furloughs, toxic work environments, and having a bad boss. And there's actually been some research done that states having a poor leader, working in a toxic environment, or having a bad boss certainly can contribute to depression and some researchers have gone as far to say that it will take years off of your life, which is pretty serious. So why is this relevant? Why is it important to talk about the connection between career development and mental health? Why is that important? Let's talk about that. Um, why is it relevant? Well, as we know, the number of individuals that are diagnosed with mental health have certainly uh, been on the rise. So if we look at approximately one in five adults, uh, 43.8 million individuals experience mental illness in a given year. Uh, approximately one in 25 adults, uh, 9.8 million experiences a serious mental illness in a given year. And so these individuals also are either interested in work, they have to work, or currently in work environments as well. 
So why is this relevant? Increase the number of dual mental health and career development needs. And as practitioners, we have the obligation to above all else do no harm. And when individuals are presented to us, how do we address both issues appropriately? Many times it's very ambiguous. We don't understand fully what's happening with the client. And, but more importantly, we need to understand that mental health and career development are co-influencers. So it's hard to separate the two. So what are some of the populations that we have to, um, or that we come in contact with? And I know as a provider, I have clients that present for career development needs that have already been diagnosed with some sort of mental illness. However, I have some that are undiagnosed and then I have others that are underdiagnosed. So they actually are experiencing possibly some serious mental health issues and they haven't been diagnosed yet. Also, I get a lot of EAP referrals from work organizations and EAP, which is Employee Assistant Programs, for individuals who may be experiencing grief, um, other stress-related um, disorders, anxiety, due to an onset. So this could be someone close to them that passes away, um, they are going through a divorce, but it's impacting their work. So therefore, um, the individual comes or presents for services. So therefore, it's up to me to be able to address the work-related issues, but also the factors that are related to their mental health. So mental health coexists with mental illness. I think it's important to make that distinguish between the two. What is mental illness and then what is mental health? And so, of course, mental illness is something that's been diagnosed um, involving changes in emotion, thinking or behavior. Mental illness tends to be associated, of course, with some sort of distress. It's something that has impaired our functioning. And then mental health encompasses, of course, our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, which of course also impacts how we think, how we feel, and our behavior patterns as well. And our mental health is important in every stage of our life. And it's something that we have to look at when we're serving clients um, in terms of children, of course, as well as adults. Now, the important piece is intervention, working with individuals who have career development and mental health needs. So let's take a look. One of my favorite quotes, uh, Abraham Maslow says, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. And so if we operate with one or two treatment modalities, we tend to address the, all clients in the same way. And so if we are trained as career practitioners, it's very easy to dismiss the other symptoms or factors that's influencing the client's behavior. So one of the models um, I developed and what I look at, this, this model, it's ideal for practitioners who do not have a background in mental health. So what happens when you have this client that presents themselves for career development, concerns or issues, but you recognize that there's something else happening here? Well, I always suggest, of course, when you have a client that you're going to do an intake. An intake certainly should include a level of screening. Now, how intense that screening is, is going to be depending on your setting, uh, the infrastructure, and also your level of training. 
And this is where I always suggest, how do you evaluate the cognitive bandwidth of that particular client? You're also going to collect demographic information, and then, which would include also maybe some level of social history, any medical issues, as well as any crisis points that they may be experiencing at that time. So also, I'm gonna go back for just a second. When we talk about collaborating, what does that mean? If you're feeling like there's something happening here that you may be uncomfortable, uncertain, or that's out of your scope of practice, seek consultation. And that certainly can be a supervisor. For example, if you're on a college campus, maybe contact the counseling center and discuss, discuss what symptoms or behaviors that you feel like this uh, student or client is presenting and maybe get some expertise or um, advice from them. And then, of course, this would include getting the client's input. And then connecting would be how do you connect the client or student to someone who can further assist, assist them because their situation or their case is, is out of your scope of practice. Either you're uncomfortable, you haven't been trained, or they need a level of expertise that you do not have. Okay? So myself, I'm actually a provider that can address career development needs, and I'm also a clinician that can address mental health. So what happens when we are actually a temp or our work, our interventive pieces in terms of addressing the client that has both? So, of course, the art of helping. How do we use helping skills to facilitate a change in the behavior to address both needs? I believe in the art of assessing, selecting the right tool or construct, and that can be informal or formal. And then the art of referral. What is the best option for the client and the student? Which Dr. Hall will address that particular component more in detail. So I want to take a look at the art of assessing because this is what gives me certainly great insight or, or more insight, I would say, depending on the instrument on this particular client or, stu or student. And this is where we're using a tool or technique to collect data so that we can formulate the appropriate treatment plan or provide the client or student with the appropriate resources. So this enables the practitioner to learn more about the needs, their decision-making skills, their career maturity. Also, it can give us insight on any irrational beliefs. It can expose various characteristics, of course, interests, ability, skills, values, but also it enables the client to participate in a level of self-discovery, which is important. I also use the assessment component to measure progress. I like to do pre and post in certain situations. If, it's, if I'm gonna be working with the client or student on a long-term basis. And so I can see where we started also, it could be a midway segment as well as at the point of termination to see what goals have been accomplished or achieved. Of course, there's uh, accountability and responsibility that's involved when we provide assessments. Um, the ethical guidelines, we want to have knowledge, basic principles of the assessment. Um, are you using, you, I like to begin with non-diagnostic tools and that can usually give me some insight and tell me what tool may be possibly that I need to elevate to. Understand details, 
make sure that you prepare the client, of course, if you're going to actually administer an assessment and then certainly know how to interpret. And we never want to use a tool, of course, that we don't know how to interpret for the, for the actual client. I wanted to share some of the actual assessments that I use that will help me in terms of working with clients that um, I, in the, in, in the screening process, discover that there may be some additional issues other than career development. And of course, the assessment that I decide is going to depend on information that may be revealed in the screening, but I wanted to share with you some that I have used or that may be appropriate as a single tool or multiple tools. In many cases, I will layer my assessments and start with the non-diagnostic and actually elevate to more um, diagnostic tools or more intense tools, depending on the client. And so we have the Beck Depression, we have Berkman, Career Thoughts Inventory, uh, the Five Factor, Personality Questionnaire, um, the Holmes Ray Life Stress, uh, MMPI, the Life Assessment, Motivational Interviewing. And that's where, of course, that's non-diagnostic, but this is where I can actually ask, of course, some questions and do the interviewing um, to begin to facilitate the change process. Uh, neo personality, powerful questions, uh, problem space, 16 personality types. Also, I've even had the client to write a structured or unstructured autobiography. The occupational stress inventory, the life wheel, FFNPQ, in many cases, I'll offer a self-care checklist to kind of see how are they caring for themselves and their perspective of themselves. How do they see themselves, which can give me some insight as well. And the last one I have here, self-care and lifestyle balance inventory. Um, and I want to share just in detail of a little more about a few of these that I've used. So asking powerful questions. And this is one that I like to start with in, in career development, also mental health, and just asking reflective questions that enables the client to gain a sense of self-discovery. And of course, they have to have a level of introspection in order to respond. And that's what is it like to be you? What is important to you, but not urgent? What is stopping you from pursuing uh, your passion. The Holmes Ray, it's an oldie but goodie. I like it because they're actually, it's of course a point value because I want to see some significant life events that may have happened recently. And this is one that will give you great insight. So if they've had a major loss, and they've um, just recently maybe divorced, if they've been laid off or fired, that tells me that they are experiencing um, some major stress and anxiety, could be grief involved, and that can certainly direct my treatment modality as well. The back depression, this is one, um, I also classify this one as an old dear giddy and giddy because it's been around for quite some time. I like this one because it's brief. The individual can self score. Um, it's, you can use it for teenagers as well as adults or adolescents. And it's one of the most widely used um, psychometric tests for measuring the severity of, of depression, okay? So the career thoughts inventory, uh, this identifies, of course, individuals who would benefit from career counseling. 
Um, this one's 48 items that measures dysfunctional thoughts in terms of career choice. So typically I would give this maybe in conjunction with, for example, the bag. So I'm looking at how they're viewing their outlook on their career as well as assessing uh, depressive behavior. The Berkman method, uh, this tells me maybe the, uh, examines personality, tells me some, gives me some insight, of course, on their personality. It also gives behavioral and occupational data. Um, this one looks at in the individual's underlying needs. And so I like it because it's a multidimensional, and this is one that I probably would give as a part of um, a package or multiple assessments. The decision space worksheet, and this one's very interesting, and it, it, it and this is good for clients who connect with visual because it's a cognitive mapping task, and this is where the client will map out, visualize, and hopefully get clarity on a decision at hand. And this helps the client actually reveal their thoughts and feelings, uh, the persons and circumstances associated with their career decision. And they also prioritize importance of contextual influences. So let's just take a look. I thought I'd share with you a sample of what that looks like. Um, as you can see, what's really important. They, you can number also, um, you can tell the level of importance by what the size of the circle. Okay. Also, the life wheel. This is one that I use pretty often. And in many cases, I will use this in the screening process and have the individual look at the core areas of their life and basically give themselves a grade. They're going to rate themselves based on a scale, 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. And we're looking at their level of satisfaction. Um, in many cases, I have markers or crayons where they're able to color in. And again, this is an excellent visual. So once they're done, they can see, wow, the areas that they have very mi little or minimal satisfaction. And then certainly based on the color scheme, they can tell the areas where they have a high level. And typically I'll give different colors so that we can have somewhat of a color spectrum which really gives more in the visual impact. And as I get to see, of course, I begin with the areas that are their strengths. So we start if someone has a nine or 10, and that gives me the core components that we can actually build upon their areas of strength. And then I'll move to the lower areas, the areas where they rank themselves lower in satisfaction. So what are some typical issues, of course, reveal the areas where there's self-doubt, overall their quality of life, I get to see based on what's revealed in the life wheel. Their family, how they feel about their family, do they have a support system, finances, and that's such a core area if they're struggling financially, has that led to stress, anxiety, depression? how they feel about where they currently work, their interests, um, and of course, their overall quality of life. So that actually concludes um, just that initial segment. And then we can talk a little bit more about the referral and collaboration process. If this is not in your scope of practice, how do I appropriately connect the person to the, the level of care or resource that's going to be needed for their particular case?
Dr. Gibbons, that was amazing. We do have some comments and questions in the chat that I'd like to share with you. Okay. The first one is a this first one's a comment. It says, this also applies to autism. Knowing how to give appropriate referrals is so important. So yes, that's a wonderful comment. Thank you for the person that wrote that. And this person writes, for those of us in private practice, for example, career coaches, entrepreneurs, what are some suggestions for referring out clients who need help beyond our scope? Absolutely. So what I always suggest is connecting with a mental health provider. Co-treatment is going to be the best scenario for a client that you are providing services for solely for career development. It could be job search, resume, or overall just career coaching. Connect with mental health practitioners that, for example, don't see individuals for career. And you have them to, of course, sign an informed consent form that they can actually speak with you. Um, I suggest that maybe you have a briefing. It could be monthly, every six weeks regarding the client so that you can make sure that you both are working together to treat the client holistically and that you are in sync in terms of the goals and that you're both on track to meeting the goals and both issues are being addressed. So it's important to connect with a mental health provider or providers and actually um, be able to co-treat the client. Now, I, it's important when I say connect is to build relationships with clinicians that you can have a direct referral source. If you don't know, Psychology Today, of course, is going to be an excellent resource to, and, and what we do on Psychology Today is actually put, of course, our areas of interest. And so that you can know if the client has some um, specific needs that you could should be able to tell from their profile that they would be able to treat that. The additional comments and questions that are in the chat, we will talk about later on during the webinar. Thank you, Sharon, that was great. Next, we'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Hall. Dr. Hall, please turn your audio on. Um, hello, thank you for that welcome. I'm going to transition now and talk about what comes next. Sharon made the point that um, it is important for us to know exactly um, whether or not we are treating um, and intervening with uh, mental health issues uh, before we engage in career uh, interventions, whether we will do this simultaneous, have both um, mental health uh, counseling and we will have um, career counseling interventions occurring simultaneously or whether we will suspend or delay um, career counseling until after mental health intervention um, um, is concluded. Um, so let's take a look now at what is the general background that will help us to um, know that we are on solid ground as we approach this delicate this delicate issue? To counsel or not to counsel, it's a question of identity. The uh, Handbook of Career Development from an International Perspective uh, points out that there are um, 10 competencies that we hold in common. And what I want to do is I'm going to address five of those that are relevant for our topic for today that will uh, help us to see that we are in fact on solid ground as we address both the career and the mental health challenges. Competency number one states that the career professional is capable of accurately and thoroughly 
conceptualizing and diagnosing clients needs based on various assessment tools and techniques. So that's the first of the five competencies that are relevant. Competency number two states that the global career practitioner is able to use uh, data derived from assessment appropriately and modify it according to the client's cultural milieu or, and or situation. Competency number three is that as professionals, we are able to identify situations that require referral to specialized services. Obviously, this is very domain to this second part of our consideration in our seminar today, the referral and the collaboration process. Competency number four states that we are able to facilitate effective referral by means of initiating contacts between referral sources and uh, the presenting individuals, the client. And then competency number five states that the global career practitioner maintains an up-to-date listing of referral sources. Again, I presented the graphic you have in the uh, handout, uh, the reference, but again, those are the ones that are most germane to our topic today. Note, again, numbers three and number four and number five. Number three, that we are able to identify situations that do require a referral. Number, that's number three. Number four, we can facilitate that referral, not only identify the situation, but we can facilitate an effective referral. And then number five, we maintain an effective referral listing. Let's turn now and look at the first of it. We want us to really look at considering ourselves in terms of a referral and collaborative process as this existing on a continuum. The first is those situations when we will refer only. That's what people often think about when we think about making a referral. That is having a name of a professional and simply passing that professional's name on to our, uh, to our client. And so it's going to be important that we um, um, know and have an active list to do that. Whether we do that the old-fashioned way, um, a business card, bookmark, um, some tangible collateral or if we do it elect, uh, electronically. Um, that's uh, the method that people most often think of and particularly as beginning um, professionals um, we will use that method a, a great deal. There's also the uh, moving in on the continuum where we actually make and have direct contact. We will make direct contact with um, a, a, refer, uh, a referral source and um, assess the person that we're um, giving um, our client their name and to kind of give them heads up and to uh, maybe investigate whether they believe the individual might be appropriate for an initial uh, initial consultation between the two of them. So we may be more directly involved in making the, uh, the making the referral. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, moving from just giving our client a name to actually warming up the lead, as it were, by having direct contact with the referral source uh, to facilitate the contact. Um, there is uh, the place where we actually hold ongoing collaboration. Um, this is the ideal, this is the best practice um, that you will increasingly find uh, modeled um, in the marketplace uh, across the across the across the globe, um, that is where uh, we do more than just pass on information, but actually have ongoing dialogue between the client um, and the referral source. What you may want to consider here is how do you establish this continuum of um, interprofessional referral and collaboration uh, relationship. Um, the, what I 
um, have in front of you and what's in your handout is a four-step model that is uh, has been uh, tested in the healthcare uh, arena uh, in particular and has wide application in a number of uh, in a number of uh, in a number of settings uh, step one is to initiate a professional relationship with the mental health um, practitioner or the mental health agency, whether it's a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, or a more traditional healthcare professional, um, medical physician, um, or a nursing practitioner. Um, so the first is to initiate contact. As you know, um, it's helpful to periodically meet with individuals in your network, uh, your professional network, um, to introduce them, to introduce yourself, for them to have a chance to introduce themselves to you, to learn how um, you design and approach your practice. So initiate that. A, a, a coffee, a lunch meal sometimes, or just invite them to your setting um, or you uh, visit uh, in their setting. So you'll want to initiate. Uh, you'll want to initiate. Step two um, is clarify the role of the practitioner. Um, and what's helpful is to do so in the context of um, healthcare's gold standard. Um, and the Healthcare's goal standard is that um, increasingly medicine is adopting the notion that we must be patient centered in contrast to being um, uh, medical centered, i.e., that the client is the driver in the relationship. So, talk about um, and clarify your role as a career practitioner and the relational ways in which you um, the way relational ways in which you uh, conduct your practice. The third um, phase is to uh, discuss uh, how um, the career intervention and the mental health intervention will interact. If you're referring out for counseling, if you're referring out for further diagnostic um, um, uh, assessments, then talk about how you will simultaneously uh, be conducting career intervention or whether you will um, delay career intervention until there's been some progress on the mental health um, need that's been, ident that's been identified. So talk about that and then um, have some understanding between your referral source and your function as a career practitioner. And then finally, the final step, step four, um, has to do with uh, establishing your interprofessional boundaries. As you know, social workers, psychologists, counselors, um, medical professionals all have different uh, boundaries. Some are more permeable, um, some are a little more fluid in terms of how they exchange information and how they want to interact with um, adjunct, uh, adjunct um, providers as we are sometimes called. Uh, so find out what works for them. Do they want a monthly, quarterly um, uh, interaction from you or feedback from you if you're doing simultaneously career intervention while they're doing the mental health intervention. Find out whether they want it by phone or email or whether they want a, a one-page summary or half a page summary. Uh, so find out what works for them, what's compatible for them given their professional identity. Um, so talk about that and have that firmly understood. So those are four steps that have um, a lot of application uh, not only with medical people, but also other um, mental health or helping professionals that can facilitate um, really working with individuals who may be doing the mental health uh, counseling um, so that you can focus on the career counseling component. I'm now going to invite um, moderator Marie Smith uh, to take us to our final component. Hi everyone, we do have some questions and comments in the chat, so I'll go ahead and share those with both of you, Dr. Michael Hall and Dr. Sharon Gibbons. This, this question says, are there specific questions that help with collecting specific data about the client in regard to this topic?
I can repeat the question if you want. Are there specific questions that help with collecting specific data about the client in regards to this topic? So the topic of their career development needs or mental health needs or um, it looks like other specific questions that a person can ask a client to collect data about mental health and career development. So that's, I mentioned earlier about the powerful questions. One of the ones I like is what is it like to be you? And that gives me a perspective of how they see their life or their work or their combination um, of the two. Or of course the assessments, depending on which one, the life wheel for me when I ask them to rate the major, the core areas of their life reveals a great deal of information about career, their work, the perspective of their work, as well as their mental health uh, and also their social and support system as well. I also find that, that it's helpful to think about uh, from a general human development or even a psychosocial perspective to think about the aspects of the presentation um, that the career client uh, brings to your office. Uh, so if they give some symptoms that there may be something that requires further assessment and intervention that's more um, cognitive, then you'll ask questions about um, their cognitive or their thinking function. You seem to have some difficulty uh, concentrating. You say that you have difficulty remembering things. So you can ask specific questions about their cognitive function that then leads to um, have you talked to um, your primary care uh, physician uh, about your thinking? Um, if it's emotional, um, have you uh, thought uh, about or had conversations with your primary care or any other health care provider about your emotions and how they are affecting your ability to choose a college major. Um, if it's emotional, if it's behavioral, then ask questions. Um, you indicate that you find that it's distracting at work when you continue to uh, tap your feet or pull your hair or chew on your hair. Um, have you spoken with uh, a healthcare professional about that. So think about the three domains again, cognitive, emotional, behavioral. Form questions about whether the client is aware that they are disruptive and whether they've sought um, um, consultation with other healthcare professionals. And if not, would they be open to um, having dialogue or, uh, um, with a healthcare professional um, on either of those, uh, either or a combination of those three levels. So ask questions specific about the symptoms that they present. This question is for Dr. Gibbons. It says, you mentioned an autobiography exercise. Can you explain that? Certainly. Um, this is where I will have the client to write about themselves, um, which would include um, their general background, family, and also maybe who influenced them as well. Typically, we'll have guiding questions that I will um, offer to them that they to make sure that they include specific information about themselves and their perspective of themselves, because that's very important is how they see themselves and also as well as their future. I always include a question. And a lot of times I will change the guiding questions based on, as Dr. Hall mentioned, the symptoms. And so my assessment process is always driven, which means what which assessment I decide to use is gonna be driven on the behaviors and symptoms, et cetera, that the, that the client presents at the time. Of service. This next question says, what assessments do you recommend to use with individuals who are homeless who are seeking employment or a more sustainable labor market? And I believe several of the ones that I mentioned earlier, um, I mean, you can actually use 
Of course, I would want to figure out their level of depression. If they're homeless, for example, um, are they contemplating suicide? Um, how would be one of the things that I would certainly want to assess um, the level of depression. And also you can certainly do the other interests and values, but I would, mental health would be a priority with that person that's actually homeless. Cause I think stabilization is going to be critical before we can actually address the career development needs. There's a couple comments in here. One says, thank you, Dr. Givens, and hi, Dr. Hall. Thank you for the handout. So that's nice. If you didn't get the handout, we can post it again, but that's great. Uh, and this person writes, very interesting to find out uh, about the how career development and mental health go together. Okay, that's great. Okay, good. Uh, this person writes, thank you both for answering my questions. I'm reading through the comments to you out loud here. Uh, this person writes, if you are a mental health professional and a career counselor, is it appropriate to combine these services? Oh, good question. Absolutely. Um, and that is a great question. And I mentioned earlier in my presentation that I'm fortunate to be able to address both. But one of the things you want in terms of there, we have to be careful in terms of the ethical component because one of the situations I would say that I face the most is people presenting for a career knowing that they have um, mental health issues. And I even had a client to say one, well, it sounded better to say that I was wanting some help with career transition versus dealing with some issues in her case that she'd been abuse. Um, because my professional disclosure, for example, is different if they're there for mental health versus if they're just coming in for maybe career counseling or career coaching. And so the construct of services, also it's important, for example, if they're dealing, if they're, if you're dealing with insurance, most insurance companies are not going to pay for just career counseling. So you're gonna get into more of the diagnosis um, process, which you consistently have to inform the client in terms of what's happening, the diagnosis process, the service delivery process as well. I'd also add that a lot of it, as Dr. Givens indicated, has to do with your professional identity. Um, how are you viewed in the uh, in the community? Are you viewed as a career counselor? Are you viewed as a professional counselor or psychologist who conducts career counseling, career coaching, career consultation? Um, so the identity has a lot to do with answer, the answer to the question, um, is, it, uh, is it appropriate? Translating, um, is it something that uh, you uh, choose to do and one by which the um, community, the professional community recognizes and refers individuals to you uh, to conduct um, you know, to conduct, you know, to conduct both. Um, as a, a PhD counseling psychologist, I have a lot of psychologists who refer to me, but they refer to me because they know that I will stay out of their backyard, uh, that I won't treat uh, depression, anxiety, and the other presenting issues, that when they refer individuals to me, it's with the understanding that, quote, I will stay in my lane, meaning that I will address vocational issues. They have comfort because they know that I understand the mental health uh, dynamics and traditional approaches, um, but that I also know how to talk about how they will be compatible with their approach to mental health counseling. Uh, so yes, you can do both, but be real clear um, with your referral sources and know how it does in fact impact your professional identity um, um, as the community in large views you. This person writes, are either of you familiar with the individual placement support IPS models? If so, have they used blending mental health and career development based on those models and how? 
Yeah, I'm I'm unfam I'm unfamiliar with that, so I I won't be able to address that directly. Dr. Givens? I'm not familiar with that either. Great. This person writes uh, that they understand the difference between career counseling, career coaching, and uh, career development coordinators, but they're curious if you have a suggestion for how to give a one sentence description to someone who doesn't already work in our field. So the difference between career counseling, career coaching, and career development coordinator or other titles, if you're describing it to someone who doesn't already work in our field. Yeah, uh, Dr. Givens and I have, have had more than a, one conversation of, about that. Um, as you, as you, as many will know, uh, the helping profession is still um, answering that question uh, for ourselves. Uh, how I describe it is to think about it as existing on a continuum, um, and there's a great deal of overlap between um, uh, between um, helping professionals. I often describe that um, if you have questions about why a decision or why there's difficulty in thinking emotions or behaviors and the and you really and you really want to do a deep dive around why then that's where uh, professional counselors that's where psychologists um, um, may have the depth of, of background to to do the deep dive if you have questions about um, what to do then uh, that's where individuals often go to consultants who help identify what to do if you want assistance with how to do it, um, sometimes um, coaching is the place to go with the focus on um, performance and deliverables. Again, great deal of overlap. Uh, they're not quite as distinct as I've described them, but that's the simplest way that I've described for uh, many individuals who are putting their toe in the water and um, we all look alike or equally as confusing to the uh, to the novice. And I always connect intervention with counselors that we have more interventive practices versus a coach is thinking about the future guidance versus intervention. This person writes do you have any recommendations regarding majors, degrees, certificates of completion, or credentials related to career development? Well, of course, the first would come to mind would be the facilitating career development course, which um, the credentials that you can obtain after you complete the course would be the CCSP, the Certified Career Services Provider as well as the GCDF, the Global Career Development Facilitator. And when individuals ask me that question, I always, um, I, I'm curious to know, what is it that you would like to do? What skills are you looking to develop and how do you want to identify yourself as a career coach, as a career, if you wanna, of course, be a counselor, that's gonna require that you enroll in a graduate program a counselor in psychology or counselor at program. And there are so many different coaching programs, but what skills are you looking to obtain and how do you want to implement or practice those skills? And also consider what population that you'd like to work with. Because I think there's some populations that we need additional training or expertise in order to be effective. <laughs> I concur with uh, with Dr. Gibbons on that. For me, the three stop points are um, where do you want to practice? Because some credentials are more accepted in one organizational uh, setting than, than another. Uh, population, as she's indicated, um, some credentials have more experience with uh, children and adolescents, some with uh, seniors, some with um, professionals, some with um, the unemployed, working, military, et cetera. And then also, uh, for me, the real driver is skills. How do you, as a career practitioner, how do you envision yourself practicing? And then when you look at the, the curriculum associated with the uh, credential, that will give you the best indicator of when you exit 
stage left with your credential in hand, um, what you will be able to do, what settings likely to respond uh, to your pre uh, to your presenting yourself as uh, for, for employment opportunities, and then what the client can expect about uh, the nature of your work. So if I had to summarize that, I would say begin with the end in mind. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Hall and Dr. Sharon Givens. We all learned a lot from both of you today. You are inspiring and informational and more. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay, bye. So bye, everyone. Thanks Thank for coming. You.